Welcome back. Last video we talked about qubits and how we think about them as a new type of information as opposed to the bits that we use in digital logic. And I use some notation for qubits that may be not familiar to you if you even if you know a little bit of linear algebra. So if you know a little bit of linear algebra you might see these column vectors where I've chosen Greek letters. That's the convention if I'm thinking about complex numbers. Maybe you've taken linear algebra where things are real. In the case of complex, you just have to be kind of uh, cognizant of the fact that there's a different sort of uh, way to multiply and add complex numbers together. but everything else is pretty much the same so I can expand any vector in what's known as a basis so you can see that if I multiply the alpha times this first vector I'll get an alpha upstairs beta times the second vector I'll get a beta downstairs and I put them together I get the original vector and Dirac introduced this notation where I replace all the vectors by this new symbol okay and so the original vector I give this new symbol uh, with a, a psi inside of it and these two uh, basis vectors I've labeled with binary digits this outside part here It's called the ket. Uh, it never appears without anything inside, but the important thing is that the thing on the inside is just the label. So in the case of bits in classical computation, we had a label for a bit as well. It was just this B. We use this extra notation uh, you know, not because we're eccentric, but be because it, it, it allows easier computation by hand. So you can already see that uh, even though we're just using two dimensional vectors, later we're going to consider exponentially large vectors, there's a huge compression in the amount of things that we have to write. So I've, I've simplified quite a bit by not having to write these potentially long column vectors. And it also allows us to easily distinguish between the, the vectors and the coefficients in front of them. In linear algebra, these particular, this particular choice of basis is special and is called the standard basis. It's kind of a basis. And it, we've chosen this basis to be the one where we, inside of these kets, we've given the symbols 0 and 1. So you can see that uh, the label of the basis is a, a bit of information. So that set, that basis, where we label it with a bit of information is called the computational basis. So standard basis, same as computational basis. And whenever we do any calculations, by and large, we're going to do them in this computational basis. If we have some vector, which can be written as a linear combination, in this particular basis, then that's called a superposition. Remember when we specify a particular vector inside of this two-dimensional complex vector space, that is the state of the qubit. And so 
this object is called a superposition state. So it's a, a particular vector in a two-dimensional complex vector space. Some special superposition states, we give their own labels rather than writing them out in, in full gore detail in their uh, linear expansion in this computational basis. We give them a special symbol. The first one is the one where the two coefficients are both 1 over root 2. That's called the plus state. And the one where there's a minus sign in front of the second computational basis state is called the minus state. And these two very special kind of superposition states will crop up over and over again. So we give them these unique symbols. Uh, worth committing to memory. If not, you will remember them for the amount of time that, that you use them. One of the other things we do in linear algebra is transpose these uh, vectors and later on matrices. When we're looking at complex numbers, we often take the complex conjugate of each of the elements of the vector as we transpose. So I'm going to turn rows into columns and columns into rows, vice versa. And every time I do that, I take the complex conjugate of each of the elements of that column vector or row vector. And you can see that although this new object isn't a vector anymore because Originally, I said the vector space was these column vectors. They can always be placed in a one-to-one -one correspondence with them. And we can play the same trick. So you can see that I have these new objects, these row vectors instead of column vectors. And in Dirac notation, we use a new symbol, very similar to the old symbol, and keep the same label for the corresponding row vector from the column vector. So I have this row vector with one zero that corresponds under this complex conjugate transpose to the original column vector up here, which had a one at the top and zero at the bottom. So I give it the same label, but I use this new notation. And I do the same thing with the original vector. So the original vector psi, remember, was this complex two-dimensional column vector. Now I have a complex two-dimensional row vector, and I can get from one to the other by taking this complex um, conjugate transpose. This, in the same way as Ket's, has its own name, so the outer kind of uh, symbols in this, for this object is called the bra, and again the thing inside is a label, and the label comes from the original So this label is the one corresponding to the original vector. Okay, so that's what that label is. And things that you do with the complex conjugate transpose involve like inner products when I want to test whether vectors or are, are, are orthogonal, for example. So let me give you an example of how we can do a calculation 
that is natural in linear algebra, but with Dirac notation. So in Dirac notation, uh, well, first of all, in usual everyday linear algebra, I would calculate the norm of a vector the norm of a vector by taking one copy of the vector complex conjugate transpose times the original vector. In Dirac notation I replace those two objects with their corresponding bras and cats. Uh, when I put a bra and a cat together I get a bracket. So that's where the uh, terminology bracket notation comes from. So I can take this bracket. So I'm going to take uh, this definition here and this definition here. And I'm going to just put them together, multiply them together. So I have alpha conjugate, beta conjugate. Oh. Don't let me forget my bras and cats. That's the psi bra. And then the psi cat. And I will multiply these two things together and distribute them just as I would when I'm doing regular multiplication. So first these two terms here, that's alpha star, alpha, and I put these this bra and this cat together. Now I have this one and this one. And you see that there's four possibilities. You just write them all out. The one, and then the last two, uh, beta alpha, and then um, the beta beta term. Okay. So now we have a bunch of inner products and the computational basis is an orthonormal basis, which means whenever I have the same label inside of the bra and the cat, that's equal to one, different labels equal zero because it's an orthogonal basis. So I can easily uh, see how this gets reduced. Now, when you're doing your computations by hand in the future, you'll often skip this step here that I've taken because as you're distributing this, uh, these brackets together, you can see right away which terms you don't need to include. So the, the beta star alpha term can just be ignored right away because you can see that the labels inside of the cats are different. So that's sort of the economy that's afforded by Dirac notation. So what's, what I'm left with is uh, the, the two terms that have a, a one in there in the product and of course that's one as required. Okay so that's sort of the computation that you'll be doing over and over again using this Dirac notation and uh, the Dirac notation works for any vector uh, but you'll see that we'll always be expanding vectors in this this computational basis. So next we'll see how the Dirac notation connects to how we're going to change the states of a qubit.